Jake Sullivan said that this war in Ukraine was totally unpredictable. There have been a lot of analyses of how this war would unfold coming from a lot of quarters. And we've seen numerous uh, changes in those analyses over time as dynamic battle for battlefield conditions change. So what we have said from multiple podiums and multiple briefings remains the same, which is we're doing everything we can to support Ukraine and its counteroffensive. We're not going to handicap the outcome. We're not going to predict what's going to happen because this war has been inherently unpredictable. Uh, and that's all I can say today, other than I believe and have confidence in the capacity and especially the bravery of the Ukrainian fighters uh, to continue to make progress on the battlefield. How do you see his statement? Well, well, it's just it, it underscores how out of touch with reality they are. Uh, it, it's quite predictable what's going to happen. Um, Ukraine's ability to stay in this war hinges on several things. One, do they have enough manpower to fill the ranks that are where soldiers are being killed and wounded in just enormous numbers? Uh, the answer to that appears to be no. Uh, they're increasingly having to go after men that are over the age of 40 and getting some as old as 60 and older. Uh, so, that, you know, they're not physically equipped uh, to fight that kind of war. The, the second element is entirely dependent upon financial aid and military assistance from the United States and some of the other NATO countries. If that dries up, uh, you know, Ukraine would, does not have the financial wherewithal to stay in the fight. They will have to surrender. So, you know, I, I think sort of those two, those are the two critical uh, variables to watch. And, you know, controlling those variables makes it quite predictable. You can say, you know, if, if Sullivan says, okay, we're going to continue to fund Iraq, Ukraine no matter what, well, that's sort of silly because at, at the current rate, Ukraine has used up its best soldiers and its best military equipment and has made virtually no progress on the battlefield. So There is a guy who is so close to Kadyrov. He's called Alaudinov, something like mm -hmm. that. And he announced that Russia going to go on offensive. And earlier this day, after a meeting with Putin, the head of the Zaporizhia region announced a lot of inter interesting things on the on the fronts of a special military operation in the fall they they they're still talking about the fall and right. now we have some offensive in kupian's direction how do you see the russian strategy well i i think russia is not going to spend a lot of time talking about what they're going to do uh and i've used statements by kadyrov and others uh with a little bit of skepticism um, if they're talking, they're talking out of school. Uh, the Russian military is not like the Ukrainian military, who was announcing months in advance, oh, we're going to do this offensive in the spring. No, no, we're going to do it in the summer, but we're going to we're going to attack in the summer. You know, they were laying out their plan publicly, which is just crazy. Uh, and, uh, you know, Russia countered it. So I the general staff of the Russian military, they have a they have plans, multiple plans, and they're figuring it out what to do on their timetable and their schedule. There is no time pressure. They're not, they're not uh, facing a deadline that they have to accomplish this task by uh, the end of October, say, or else. Uh, they have time on their side, and they are uh, causing more casualties on the Ukrainian side than the Ukrainians are causing on the Russian side, for starters. But we'll face the facts. Russia has got, what, 150, 160 million people in this country. Ukraine now has 25 million. So the, the, Russia dwarfs Ukraine. And Ukraine, a lot of the able-bodied men that could, uh, could or should be drafted into the military have fled the country and are living in uh, Poland, Romania, Hungary, other France, Germany, other places. Do you think as as long as we have Zelensky in power in Ukraine, are we going to see some changes in their policy toward this war? No, <clears throat> um, this is not going to end until uh, Zelensky's gone. 
Zelensky is not the controlling power. Zelensky is a figurehead, a popular figurehead in some circles, uh, but he, you know, he, he didn't win this on his own. Kolomoisky, one of the uh, Jewish oligarch, was behind his rise to power, and uh, there are others that are keeping him there. But you know, he's going to come into conflict, I think, with the military at some point here in the near future, particularly if the as this counteroffensive fizzles and they make really no progress whatsoever, uh, then the finger pointing is going to come start and uh, politicians will blame the military, military will blame the politicians. And since the military has the guns and the politicians don't, I always side with the military in those battles. After these cluster bombs, they're sending F-16s to Ukraine. And now they're talking about cruise missiles. How do you see this policy of sending more and more weapons that they, they're not being used efficiently in Ukraine? You know, it's, it's the wonder the wonder weapon phenomena. They keep, uh, uh, they keep hoping that uh, somehow magically you can introduce a weapon and the Russians are going to collapse. You know, look, we need to, you know, the, the F-16 for starters. That, uh, I think that airplane may be older than you. Uh, it's a 50-year-old airplane. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not a modern jet, even though it's it's, ta- it's still in use. But it's it's 50-year-old technology, basically. Uh, it's, it's not the latest, greatest. Uh, and to send them in any kind of numbers that would... I, uh, let me rephrase that. The United States and all of NATO combined are not going to send the number of planes that might create a problem for Russia. Instead, they're just going to send enough that Russia will get great target practice shooting down this aircraft. And, uh, you know, maybe the, the best way to monitor it is to see what the London bookies are predicting uh, with, with respect to uh, how long they ex- anticipate the aircraft would last once it arrives in theater. Means that they are getting rid of those old weapons to have new orders. I mean, that's it is it's sort of like spring cleaning. You know, you get rid of all the junk in your closet and then you go out and buy new junk. Um, and that's exactly what's happening. Several countries are giving up F-16s because they're being promised, oh, we'll, we'll give you a deal on F-35s. So they get a more modern, more costly, more expensive plane. You know, the when you compl- compare what it costs to fly and maintain an F-35 to that the cost of an F-16, it's, just, it's, it's colossal, the difference. Much more expensive. I don't know if you saw this video of a Canadian mercenary. He says that I'm very grateful that we are, not fi- we are fighting Russians, not Americans. And do you know what? I'm very grateful we're fighting Russia and not America. You know, the Russians have caused a lot of damage there, but there's some things there's some things that the Russians never seem to do in the war that I would have thought, mm-hmm. why don't they just blow up all the bridges? Why don't they blow up all the railways? And then they can... But anyway, I'm on a, I'm on a train, and I'm on a train that's a big moving target, mm-hmm. um, and I'm traveling during the day, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking out the windows, and I've, I've seen... Uh, I've seen what looked like an oil derrick on fire, the train is probably half full of civilians, uh, or, or maybe a third full. Of people going to? Going to Kiev. It's actually quite a prominent church in Kiev, uh, like, a, like a monastery. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. Um, yeah. I, I, I think, you, I, are you telling the enemy now something that he would like to know? Sure, maybe about 10, 10 12 months ago they would have liked to know than that. Right. Well, that's true. I mean, they've, that's why this has been called a special military operation. It has not been focused on targeting civilians and killing civilians. You know, remember during World War II, when both uh, the Germans and the British and Americans, when, they were, when we were bombing German cities, we were killing civilians in, you know, horrendous numbers. Uh, and Germans did the same to the Brits. So, you know, there was no regard in that war with we would try to not kill civilians. Uh, Russia's taking great pains that they're only hitting military targets or strategic targets that uh, go to generation of power, transportation, 
uh, to disrupt the ability of the Ukrainian army to resupply its troops and to move forces and equipment forward to the front lines. Um, this, you know, if this escalates to a war footing, war will be quite, war is quite different from a special military operation. Number one, it means that they will go after satellites. They'll go after Western uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance platforms, both uh, aircraft such as the Rivet Joint uh, and then uh, drones, uh, including Global Hawk and others. So uh, take out satellites, take out drones, take out all communications, bomb and destroy government buildings in mass. Uh, take out the presidential palace, you know, the president's residence in Kiev. You know, so it would be it would be a, a dramatic escalation in uh, Russian firepower and uh, the casualties that the Ukrainians would suffer. How do you see this transformation of the Russian army? They changed their strategy during this war. They learned a lot how to figure out their problems in Ukraine. They, they're now producing drones in large numbers. Well, uh, it does show that the Russians are not l locked into a rigid ideology. They're not married to a particular doctrine and strategy, that they are flexible, that they're responding to what's going on on the ground. But they entered this war with two things in their favor. One, they had as good of ISR capability as NATO. I ISR stands for Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. Second, they had a much better uh, human intelligence advantage over NATO. Uh, Russia, just by virtue of its experience with intelligence operations, has a far easier task of recruiting and running intelligence assets that are working in NATO headquarters uh, and at the uh, U.S. Uh, Euro European Command headquarters there in Stuttgart. Um, then the third element is what's called net-centric warfare, the, the ability to bring the computer information and integrate it with ground troops, mobile troops that are you know in tanks and, and armored vehicles, with artillery, both fixed and mobile, with drones, with combat air, both uh, fixed wing, rotary wing. All of that comes together with communication going back and forth and a coordination that, frankly, the, the United States and NATO just uh, do, do not enjoy. So that combination of net-centric warfare and the I, robust ISR, this has really changed how they have to fight the war. You know, if you go back to World War II tactics, uh, it was very difficult for, say, the German army to figure out what the Russians were doing because they had to get aircraft up, fly that aircraft over Russian territory and hope that they could either take photographs or get some you know, visual identification, eyes on target, to, to describe where the troops were moving, where they were building up, how many were down there. Well, now with the satellites, fixed wing aircraft, drones, there, it's virtually impossible to move troops in a large formation and assemble them in an area for in preparation for an attack. You have to spread them out. You have to hide them. That becomes more challenging uh, because of the technology that exists now that didn't exist 80 years ago during, during World War II and candidly didn't really exist during the Vietnam War 60 years ago. So you've, uh, and then add to that, you've got uh, sensors that can see through clouds night vision you can see through the darkness uh you can see sometimes through the smoke so this uh, it, it's changed that uh you're not going to get the conventional massive uh you know 20,000 man army assembled in one location that's going to drive outward and you know crush the russians or vice versa so the, you know people that are looking for what i'd call these big aerial offensive i think are looking in vain because uh, Russia, when it attacks, it's going to do it in, in a way that's new with what we're not accustomed to seeing with, uh, say, World War II tactics. 
the other aspect of this special military operation was this casualty ratio. Because when this war started, the curve was like this, drastically increasing. Now, when you look at the number of casualties, they, they reduced a lot, 8 to 1, 10 to 1. Mm -hmm. how, they, how they could do that? It's a simple math problem. Russia has 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 times the number of artillery shells uh, and is able to fire at a much higher volume than Ukraine. So for every one shell Ukraine fires, uh, the Russians fire eight back. Well, that's where the casualties are coming from, primarily also the artillery strikes, air strikes, uh, drone, drone strikes. It's not coming from soldiers creeping up on positions and firing uh, their rifles. There's some of that, but most of it's the artillery. And so it's just the it's just the math. If, if I'm going to fire... Uh, one shell and you're firing eight shells, the odds are you're going to hit me and I'm not going to hit you. That's why Russia has had so few casualties relative to Ukraine. It means that all these military experts like Ben Hodges, David Petraeus, knew the outcome of this counteroffensive even before this getting started. Well, they should have known, but uh, you know they've been writing and insisting that, in fact, just today, yesterday, Petraeus put out another article with uh, one of the boys at ISW, Fred Ka Kaplan, is it? And, uh, you, you know, it just, it's just delusional. They're insisting that, oh, yeah, Ukraine can still win. The, they can still break through with their counteroffensive. It's like with what? They, they have decimated this 82nd Brigade that has just come in. And it was touted as having this, you know, really incredible capability. That was going to really teach the Russians a lesson. Well, the lesson that's being taught is that, you know, all those tanks and armored personnel carriers from Bradley's to strikers are can't withstand the withering artillery barrage from Russia, coupled with uh, bombs dropped by fixed wing aircraft, uh, the, the FABs, as they're called, and uh, missiles launched from attack helicopters. Uh, the alligators. So it's just, I said, it's a math problem. And they're, they're just not paying attention to the facts. Do you think that the NATO going to let Ukraine hit some targets inside Russia with these new technologies, new weapons that are sending to Ukraine? Well, I think Ukraine's going to do that on its own with, with or without encouragement from NATO. Um, but again, it gets back to what do they have to carry out the strike? So far, they've been launching drones, and the drones are ineffective. They don't carry a large enough charge. Uh, elect Russian electronic warfare and uh, both uh, surface-to-air missile defense systems are proving pretty effective in shooting them down or preventing them from reaching a target. Uh, if Ukraine carries out a significant attack on Russian territory, uh, beyond the newly acquired Russian territory in Donetsk, Luhansk, Aparizhia, and Kherson, uh, then I think you're going to see a dramatic escalation on the part of Russia. So that's, it, you know, it's, uh, they want to they wanna hurt the Russians, and the more you hurt the Russians, the more the Russians will hurt you. How do you see this case of Pergosian? Because we remember when this started, that mutiny, they were all talking about this is this shows that Putin's weak because yeah. of that mutiny. Right now he's dead. They're talking about Putin's weak because he killed Prigozhin. This propaganda goes thicker and thicker in the mainstream media. Yeah. Well, number one, you got to ask yourself, why does the West obsess about Prigozhin? Why does the West treat him like he's Elvis Presley or Michael Jackson? Um, so I, I come back to his origins, apart from being a criminal at the outset, he's had a close relationship with the Russian military intelligence, the GRU. And the, the Wagner group was not a creation of Prigozhin. It was a creation of the Russian military intelligence, the GRU. So as such, uh, Prigozhin is just a figurehead. He played, you know, he, he like an actor. 
because uh, he actually is an actor. He owns a movie studio. And his other business, uh, Internet Research Agency, is a, specializes in creating pro Russian propaganda or propaganda not directly linked to Russia that makes its way to into U U.S. media and blogs. I've I've been getting some of their material. You know, an example: the, the IRA talks about directed energy weapons were used to set the fires in Maui. So, with all that as background, here's Pergosian. Who is just he's a figurehead and i and i still maintain that that a mutiny in june uh, was controlled it was under the tight control of russian military intelligence whether uh, how much uh, prigozhin was witting unwitting of the russian control of that uh, uh, activity i don't know but it's clear that uh whatever putin had the backing of the British and the backing of uh, the Ukrainians. And they were really counting on him to cause an upheaval, a, a coup to take out Putin. That is ridiculous. Never going to happen. Uh, during the course of that mutiny, and again, I believe it was, let's call it staged. It was designed, it was controlled. Uh, some of the Wagner troops killed and shot down using surface air missiles some Russian uh, helicopters and, and fixed-wing aircraft killed by pilots and crew. So when you look at what happened to Prigozhin's plane, the way it came down, it the wings were sheared off uh, while it was in flight. Uh, the most likely explanation for that is a bomb was placed in the wheel wells. The, the landing gear attaches up under the wing, comes down out of the landing gear. So... Um, or the landing gear comes down out of the wing, and there are two on either side and one on the nose. Uh, I think someone planted a bomb, maybe on one of the wings, maybe both. But uh, when that explosion took place, it, it tore off the wings. And so at that point, the plane you know, apparently initially climbed and then it started falling. And if you look at any of the images falling, you can see it doesn't uh, it doesn't have uh, wings, but you can still see the two engines attached to the tail, and it, it it slowly turns. So that means most likely there was a portion of wing sticking out on one side, because that would create an aerodynamic effect that would cause the plane to turn as it comes down, and then it hit the ground and it exploded. You see a trail of a vapor coming out of it, and that was probably the fuel leaking. Uh, from uh, the fuel tanks uh, that are part of the plane connected to the fuselage. So you, you go down the list. Who could have who could have killed? This was sabotage. I do not believe it was Putin at all. I don't believe this was an authorized uh, activity by Russian intelligence, whether it's FSB or the GRU. Because in any kind of intelligence operation, you want to preserve what they call plausible deniability. Or there, there's a saying that's a little crude, but it basically says uh, you don't defecate where you eat or where you sleep. You know, that's what the bathroom's for. And so if you're going to kill Prigozhin, why do it on Russian territory? Why do it on the very day that they're celebrating the 80th anniversary of the Soviet victory in Kursk? Uh, why do it while Russia's foreign minister Lavrov is at the BRICS summit? And that's uh, coming to a conclusion. There was just no good reason. And and plus, if the GRU wanted to kill Prigozhin, they could have taken him out in Africa. And in Africa, you're not going to get an investigation of a plane that goes down or if someone gets shot or blown up in a car bomb. There are lots of ways Prigozhin could have been killed if the GRU wanted to kill him. But to bring this plane down in Russia, where they can now actually do an investigation, recover the black boxes, recover some other forensic material, both from the victims and from the actual parts of the aircraft, they'll be able to reconstruct exactly what happened. And that's, you know, I, I don't see how killing Prigozhin and then creating uh, that kind of investigation evidence trail is, is going to benefit anybody in the current government. Uh, is it possible that 
some members of uh, the Wagner group dissatisfied upon learning how much money Prigozhin was making off of them and uh, wanting to punish him for that. That's possible. Uh, as I mean, made, you know, so we got the uh, Air Force officers in Russia seeking revenge for the killing their colleagues in June, taking out Prigozhin. Possibility of Wagnerians who were uh, upset with uh, his leadership uh, of the Wagner group. That's one pos another possibility. Uh, maybe a collection of oligarchs who want to embarrass Putin got together and funded a hit on Prigozhin. And, and figuring, figuring that this would create uh, some political problems for, for Putin. So you've got that possibility. Was was this an operation by Western and Ukrainian intelligence together? Has to be considered. I think it's doubtful, but it has to be taken into consideration. So you got at least four possibilities of who sabotaged this plane to bring it down. Do you think that the loss of Pergosian going to influence what the Wagner is doing in Africa? No, zero effect. Pergosian was not the commander. Pergosian was the PR guy. So, uh, you know, candidly, I, I think one of the reasons the Wagner group has got such attention of the West, it's, it's, you've been to a magic show and a magician will bring out a shiny object and hold it in their hand to distract your attention while they're doing something with their other hand. I view the Wagner group as that shiny object. Sure. Oh, the Wagner group's in Belarus. Oh, no, no, no. The Wagner group's in Africa. Oh, you know, people. Meanwhile, they're not paying attention to the other movements of Russian troops, which is, I think, one of the purposes of this, to distract Western attention so that they do not focus on what Russia is really doing with the actual army that's going to make a difference. It seems that Putin is going to meet with Erdogan from Turkey to find some solution for this grain deal. It's so amazing to see the relation between Russia and Turkey, because Turkey is part of NATO. They're sending weapons yeah. to Ukraine. On the other hand, Putin totally understands this situation for Turkey. He's still willing to negotiate with Turkey. Yeah. How do you see his manner to Turkey? Well, he hasn't been very warm towards Erdogan, number one. Number two, he's making Erdogan come to him. He's not going to Erdogan, last I checked, unless you have different information. Uh, and I think it's going to be a bit of a frosty reception. Putin is not going to be hugging him. And not, you know, it's not going to be a warm handshake. Uh, he's going to let, let Erdogan know he's in the doghouse for betraying Putin and the agreement to hold those five uh, as of commanders that were released uh, over a month ago, so uh, you know there's gonna uh, there's gonna be a bit of bowing and scraping by Erdogan, uh, you know, sort of groveling before Putin, trying to get back in Putin's good graces. Uh, I don't see Russia. Russia's in no rush to renew the oil deal, the grain deal. Uh, they're not going to benefit or help Ukraine at all now. Not at all. And they're going to make sure that the wheat that does get exported goes to the countries in Africa, particularly that need it, not to Western Europe uh, and filling the pockets of uh, the, the neo the, the colonialists who conquered Africa. How did you see this BRICS summit? Yeah, well, it's just another sign of the slippage of U.S. influence in the world. You know, remember, there was a time that Saudi Arabia was acting sort of like the poodle or the you know a pet dog that the United States could order about to do whatever we wanted. And uh, the Saudis had become very insistent upon uh, declaring their independence. And I think, you know, the BRICS move to bring in both Saudi Arabia and Iran at the same time is a recognition that, you know, this is, this is like sort of a new form of OPEC in some aspects. You know, the, uh, if Venezuela joins eventually, and if Mexico joins, and if Nigeria ever joins, I, I don't see that happening right away, but let's just say if Nigeria joins, then you've got, some, you know, the biggest oil producers in, in OPEC that are now part of BRICS. And, you know, there's, 
there's a lot of, uh, um, it gives more flexibility to, to these countries. Uh, they are no longer going to be able to be held hostage by US threats of economic sanctions or confiscation of their, of their financial resources. So I think the United States really has hurt itself by giving uh, an, an incentive for these countries to join. You got, so that's 11 now, and that's not, that's not the end of the growth of BRICS. It's ju just the beginning. Did you see how Lavrov was received in South Africa? Oh yeah. It yeah. was pretty amazing. And yeah, no, no, Lavrov's a rock star. I mean, he's uh, he's a he's a big man, and uh, you know, physically, but he's also uh, a, a, a good intellect and a very very savvy diplomat. And he knows uh, he he is respected around the world, except in the United States, because you know we we're terrified of competence. Because this is not just in South Africa. We know in Niger they're carrying Russian flag. They're mm -hmm. they're fond of Russia. How do you see this sentiment toward Russia in Africa? Well, Russia does not have a history of enslaving Africans. You know, you, the, Europe, particularly the British did. And then um, on, on top of that, the United States continued to import slaves from Africa. So the colonial past, the, 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 this other aspect of the exploitation by Germany, France, Belgium, uh, the United Kingdom, of course, Spain, Portugal, Denmark. I, you know, the, most of Europe was uh, laying claim to some parts of Africa as theirs. This is ours and exploited the country and the people accordingly. Russia never did that in its history. Never. One of the interesting thing in this NATO summit was this new entry of Iran and Saudi Arabia together. Right. We know how they were, they were so enemy of each other before these negotiations promoted by China and Russia. It, it was just two months ago, they, they started negotiating to put, put the, their differences aside. Now they're, they're part of BRICS. Yeah. And this is not the first time. We know some diff there, there are some differences between China and India. We have Iran and Saudi Arabia. They, they're not part of the same ideology, but they recognize their differences and they're ready to cooperate. How do you see this attitude in BRICS? Well, I mean, look, it challenges the very foundation of U.S. foreign policy. And on top of U.S. foreign policy, it's effective financial control of the world or attempt to financially control the world by having the United States dollar as uh, the reserve currency. So one, the, the unification of Iran and Saudi Arabia or the forging of uh, new ties, uh, opening diplomatic relations, huge development made possible because of the Russia-China su summit that took place in January, February timeframe. Uh, so with that union between, uh, let's call it the union between Saudi Arabia and, and, and Iran, that ended the war in Yemen. And the war in Yemen basically was another proxy war that the United States was helping fund in order to weaken uh, Iran or try to attack Iran. Same thing in Syria. So, uh, you know, the Saudis took the lead in bringing Syria back into the Arab League you know, almost uh, 10 years to the date that they were forced to leave under pressure from the United States over, uh, you know, the, 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 a lot of the, Arab, you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, uh, Oman, several of the Gulf states, Kuwait, joined, joined up in, in forcing Syria out of the Arab League and funding Islamic extremists that were attacking Syrians and killing Syrians. Well, that's that's been settled now. That Syria is welcome back into the Arab fold. So you, this BRICS is uh, is just another example of the weakening of the U.S. control or what it thought it was 
uh, its ability to control events in the world. Germany is in the process of deindustrializing, closing factories, closing lot, you know, thousands of businesses to shut down. So it's it's in, it's in an actual recession. It's not growing economically, and uh, there's growing anger in Germany with the existing political class. Uh, if this winter is severe, uh, or more severe than the, the relatively mild winter of last year, then you're going to see tremendous suffering throughout Europe uh, because of lack of energy. Uh, you know, one of the ironies, though, in all of this is uh, Russia is a large supplier of uranium, and one of its biggest customers is, is not was, is the United States. So notice the United States imposes sanctions on Russia, but boy, we'll still buy as much uranium as we can get from them. You know, I think at some point, uh, Russia would be in a position to really hurt the United States and say, oh, we're not sending any more uranium. Then, then the United States has got to go find an alternative source. You know that in Germany, the public opinion is changing toward this war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It seems that they're forcing some changes do you think the changes, if the changes happen in Germany, it's gonna have it's gonna have some influence on the Biden's policy in Ukraine? Well, it, it will be it will just mean that the United States is on its own. So, and I think once Germany jumps ship, other other European countries will follow. I think this is really going to create a genuine crisis for NATO because. Germans said, no, 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 we're, we're not, we're not going to continue to double down on this bad hand. This is like, uh, United States is acting like a degenerate gambler. We keep wanting to push money into the pot or into the, you know, lay bets down for the roulette wheel and we keep losing. And so you keep doubling down, putting down more money, more weapons into Ukraine and it's achieving nothing other than getting a bunch of Ukrainians killed. Do you think yeah. that eventually going to end up with Nord Stream pipeline? They they decide about just reconnecting this pipeline again? Um, I don't think any movement will be made to reconnect that pipeline until this war is settled, until Ukraine is denazified. And I actually, I, I suspect uh, Russia's goals have probably changed that they, they want to eliminate NATO and will... Uh, are hoping that this collapse of the Ukrainians will force a collapse of NATO. At least it will create a real major rift between NATO members. A lot of uh, finger pointing and recriminations. I don't uh, I don't underestimate or count out Poland's ability to try to expand the war. Because if, if Poland decides to try to cross the border into Belarus or send troops directly into uh, Ukraine, that's going to elicit a response from uh, Russia. And if Russia starts killing Polish troops that are, you know, in, in Ukrainian territory, uh, Ukraine's going to argue, argue that that's an attack on a NATO member and will seek to implement Article 5 of the NATO Charter, which means countries have to agree, you know, vote unanimously that they're going to go to war on behalf of Poland. Larry, just to wrap up this session, we know that these intelligence services in 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 the West are communicating to each other, and there is a concept like called Five Eyes. How, yeah. How how does it work? That's just it's just an intelligence sharing arrangement between uh, the UK, United Kingdom, Canada, United States, New Zealand, Australia. Five. Eyes, the I stands for intelligence. So all those intelligence services in each of those countries are supposed to share information with the other four. And that, are all. they spying on each other? Well, uh, yes, that, that happens too. So uh, is the United States spying on the United Kingdom and Australia? And uh, I would, I would presume so. And would those uh, other countries be spying on us? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's the, po the point of intelligence is you want to really know what the country's thinking and planning to do. You don't want to rely upon just what they're releasing as a press release. 
You want to know exactly what they're talking about in private, exactly what their true intentions are. You know, there's there's a phenomenon I witnessed uh, when I was uh, doing some contract work for the State Department after I left state and teaching a senior crisis management seminar. So I was involved with teaching senior government officials and police from uh, you know more than 50 countries over a, a four or five year period. And I was fascinated to find out that almost, it didn't matter whether they were from Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Israel, Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Indonesia, Malay, it didn't matter. Regardless of religion, race, uh, ethnic background, every foreigner that I encountered believed that the United States had a secret plan that we were carrying out, like in a, that our invasion in 2003 Iraq, that we had some secret plan because they couldn't believe that we were really that stupid. They felt we had some agenda, hidden agenda that we were working on and not, not telling them about. So that's one of the reasons they try to spy on us to find out what is our real hidden agenda and what they would have done. Well, I kept telling these people, I said, no, we're, we're really that dumb. You know, <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not thinking this like 3d chess. You think, you think that we think uh, like a chess master. And I said, we can barely play checkers, much less chess. Mm -hmm.